We have with us this session Brother Bruce Stolting. He has already uh, presented one lesson for us. His title today will be Christ Confronted Era About Salvation. We look forward to hearing Bruce. Bruce was born and raised in Carn City, Texas, graduated from the Southwest School of Biblical Studies in 1989, participated in the graduate program of the Memphis School of Preaching, 98 to 2000. Uh, so you're a third year graduate then? Okay. For what it's worth. He has done local work in Kansas, Missouri, Arkansas, and has been working with the Fish Hatcher Road congregation in Huntsville, Texas since 2001. He not only serves as one of the ministers, but he also serves as one of the elders of that great congregation. He's done mission work in the Philippines and Cambodia. He holds gospel meetings, speaks on several lectureships, and has conducted evangelistic campaigns in Oklahoma, Kansas, and Missouri, and has worked with several Bible youth camps. He served on the faculty of the Rose City Bible Learning Center in Little Rock, Arkansas. He's currently one of our instructors with the Truth Bible Institute, and he is the director of our Lone Star Bible Camp as well that we have each summer. He also works with the Texas Department of Transportation. Bruce, come speak to us. We look forward to hearing you. Don't, don't you get squirrely on me. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, as John said, I'm director of the Lone Star Bible Camp. That's located uh, halfway between Belleville and Brenham. It's the first week in August. Uh, we're going to have our website revised and back up probably the next week or so. It's the LoneStarBibleCamp.com. So if you want to check us out on the internet. Also, we're having a lectureship uh, this coming April the 12th and the 13th. That's Friday and Saturday at the Fish Hatchery Congregation. Everyone's invited to be uh, in attendance for that. We're going to have the theme how can I be saved? And then topics relating to how can I be saved by the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit? How can I be saved by grace, faith, study, and obedience? Uh, John, David, Jeff Lickey will be speaking, among others, from our congregation. And hopefully you can attend that uh, in April. The topic for discussion at this hour is Christ confronted error on salvation. This is a very serious topic and basically all the topics we've been discussing are serious but these relate particular to salvation. But when we think about it all of the topics that we have been discussing in this lectureship in some way or another relate to our salvation. But we're looking primarily in this lesson, the way I approached it, to the plan of salvation. And that's the way we're going to uh, look at it. We look at this lesson with a very serious uh, attitude, knowing that we will stand in the judgment and give an account to how we live and how we uh, die. You know, in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 46, when Jesus is talking about the judgment scene, those that were on the left represented by the goats who were lost would be then go away into everlasting punishment. Those on the right, the sheep, the righteous, would enter into eternal life. And so that's what really hangs in the balance based on every lesson in this lectureship. But especially so when we talk about the plan of salvation, the means by which we can be saved from our past sins. Paul warned that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of the things done in the body, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. And so we're going to begin our study looking at Jesus confronting misconceptions regarding proper authority. Now, I want to make one point really clear that if we don't get authority right, we're not going to get anything else right. A good deal of our open forum has been spent dealing with one individual that does not understand authority. And as trying as best I can not to be judgmental, it appears by his action and his persistence that he doesn't care to understand 
Bible authority. And I, I, I say that in all kindness, not to belittle or look down or hurt this young man, but to encourage him to reconsider uh, where he's coming from and basically where he wants to go. Because the way he's heading right now, he's missing the boat regarding salvation and heaven. And so we say those things in all kindness. Proper authority is essential in every endeavor, everything that we do. We need to be concerned with authority. If I go to the doctor, the doctor gives me a prescription, and I take it to the pharmacist, I want the pharmacist to fill it out according to the prescription. And I have a right to expect that from my pharmacist. In fact, it's illegal for him to violate that prescription and give me something else. Now, when we come to our salvation, things pertaining to our soul, a lot of people are less careful regarding the prescription for their soul than they are for a prescription for their health. They don't care about authority of the soul and salvation of the soul. As long as my health is good and my life seems to be good and I'm getting to do things that I want to do the way I want to do them, then I don't have to worry about that other. And we give very little thought or concern for the soul. Jesus, of course, was born under the law, as we see in Galatians 4 and verse 4, and he kept the law. But he was at a time when the law was coming to an end. In fact, in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18, he tells the apostles, this is after the resurrection, he tells the apostles, all authority has been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Now, I like the way the Bible's written and how it uses universal terms. And, and if Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth, does that mean or allow anybody else to have any authority? Absolutely not. He has all authority. Just as he said, and we need to respect that. In fact, Jesus says, He that rejects me and receives not my words has one that will judge him in the last day. The words that I spoke to him will judge him in the last day. After the cross, we are going to be judged by the words of Jesus. We're not going to be judged by the words that were given to the patriarchs. The patriarchs will be judged by those words because they lived under that law. We're not going to be judged by the things that were written in the law of Moses because it ended at the cross. We're going to be judged by the words of Jesus Christ. Those of us living after the cross will be amenable to the doctrine of Jesus Christ. And I don't have to worry about what was written or said to the patriarchs that's why I'm not out in my backyard building an ark, right? I don't have to worry about the things that were written in the law of Moses to the Israelites. That's why I'm not making animal sacrifices or burning incense and, and setting up a table of showbread. I'm not doing those things. Why? Because that law ended. This is the thing that, that, that Ricky Gambino is missing. That law in its entirety is over. We cannot go back and pick and choose things out of the Old Testament that we want to try to find authority for and bind on New Testament Christians. We can't do that. You know, just a, a summation of the, the books of Ephesians and Galatians and Hebrews should be enough to convince any right-thinking person that the old law and every aspect of that old law was nailed to the cross and ended, including instrumental music. What does it mean in, in Ephesians chapter 2 when the ordinances were nailed to the cross? And it was taken out of the way, Galatians. When it says the law was the schoolmaster for the Jews to bring them to Christ. And then once they came to Christ, what happened to the law? No longer under the schoolmaster. Romans chapter 7. We're dead to the law, free to marry another. What does that mean? The law's dead. It's gone. It's over. 
And now we're free to be married to the law of Christ. That's the point that Paul's making. And I'm glad because in that chapter, he talks about life under that old law. That law that could not redeem from sin, that could not forgive sin, except potentially based on the sacrifice of Christ. Think about that. Paul says, oh, Ray, he's talking about his life under that law. And how that he knows I, I know to do the good things and I don't do them. I know not to do those bad things and I do those things. And even the good things that I do, sin is always with me. And so he concludes, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Who's going to? That, that's pretty pitiful. Hebrews chapter 7, 8, and 9 talks about the superior nature of the new law, the new covenant. And how that Jesus had to die to enter, to usher in that new will, that new testament. And that the fact that we have a new testament, that makes the old testament old, the first one old. And the Hebrew writer says what? It's old, it's dead, it's decaying, it's ready to pass away. And I believe that the very uh, punctuation mark on the end of that law came in AD 70 when Jerusalem was destroyed along with the temple. And to say that we need to go back under that old law to find authority for things that we want to do in New Testament times is to show that we do not respect the New Testament law of Christ. That we believe that inferior Old Testament is in some way superior to the New Testament. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that he brought in a better covenant based on better promises. And if, according to Galatians, if we go back and, and try to be justified under the law, what happens? We fall from grace. And if we keep one part of the law, we're obligated to keep the whole law. These are things that we need to get straight in our mind that the New Testament is far superior than the Old Testament. And regardless of what things are in the Old Testament that we might like, that we might want or be attracted to, we can't take them this side of the cross and try to find authority to do those things today. If we can't find authority for it in the New Testament, it is sin. Isn't that Romans 14 about verse 23? What serves apart from faith is sin. If we cannot justify our actions according to the New Testament scriptures, remember faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10 and verse 17. If we cannot find authority for the things that we do in the New Testament, then we must not do them. Whether we're talking about instrumental music, whether we're talking about the priesthood, there's denominations that miss that, and I believe the clergy laity idea uh, that's based on that Old Testament hierarchy has really crept into the church to a great degree, and we exalt preachers really almost on par with the priests. And that's not right either. But the fact is, when we go to try to find the plan of salvation and the things that we're authorized to do in worship and work in the church, we need to come to the New Testament. Especially, again, especially relating to the plan of salvation. You know, there's some in the time of Jesus that trusted in human tradition, some trusted in uh, themselves, some trusted in genealogy. Jesus dealt with all of those things. We talked about those that trusted in themselves uh, in our lesson on pride. Remember, we talked about that yesterday. There are some people in Jesus' day in John chapter 8 that believed that just because they were the descendants of Abraham, they had their ticket punched and they were on their way to heaven. But the fact is, Jesus confronted that, and, and he basically said that if we know the truth, the truth will make us free. They're saying, well, you know, we're the children of Abraham, and we've never been in bondage to anyone. Well, Jesus then explains to them what? Well, I'm talking about spiritual bondage. 
And then again they say, well, we're the children of Abraham. Jesus responds and says, you know, if you're the children of Abraham, you would do the things Abraham did. He said, you want to kill me because I teach you the truth, and that's something Abraham never would have done. And so they, they go on and they say, well, we're, we're the children of God. Are they? Well, Jesus in verse 44 says, no, you're, the, you're of your father the devil. You're of your father the devil, and his works you will do. You see, these people didn't accept Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah. They didn't accept him as the source of authority. They didn't accept him as the source of salvation. In John chapter 14 and verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. That's pretty plain. It doesn't matter, children of Abraham, if you're not doing the will of God. Does it? Well, wait, it does matter if you're doing the will of God. They thought, hey, we're children of Abraham, it doesn't matter what we do. That's just not the case. You know, we think about the plan of salvation. I'm going to move on to that. I'm going to talk, I was going to talk about possessions, and I was going to talk about other things that people use for, for things to try to determine whether or not they have the, uh, the, I guess the approval of God. Again, a lot of people think, hey, my family, my possessions, what I want. You know, there's a lot of things people try to justify themselves with, how I feel. But all those things are not going to necessarily be what gets you to heaven. You know, it would be nice to be raised in a Christian home by godly parents, Right? And a lot of children that are raised in Christian homes by godly parents, they grow up and they become Christians. And they're faithful and they live and die in the church and in Christ. And they're going to go to heaven. But they don't go to heaven because they come from a Christian family. That helped along the way, no doubt. But that's not the authority by which when they stand in the judgment, they can't say, well, my parents were Christians, so let me in. If my parents are Christians, they're going to teach me the right way to approach God, the things that I need to do to obtain remission of sins, how I can worship and, and work in the, in the kingdom, and then stand justified by what I've done, by things that I've done according to my faith, according to God's word, not because of who my family is. And it doesn't matter how much wealth or possessions I have. When I stand before God in the judgment, it's going to be based on what I've done in the body, how I've lived according to God's will. <clears throat> so we think about this. Jesus presents the gospel in such a way that it is open for everyone. The Jews had a problem with this. We mentioned this in our lesson on pride yesterday. The Jews had a problem with everyone outside of their nationality. And they thought they were the only ones that were going to be saved. But, you know, Jesus, even when he was living and, and, and teaching to the Jews, he would use uh, statements like, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Again, I like the way the Bible's written. This is a universal term. If Jesus inviting all to come, does that leave anybody out? Was that just for all Jews? Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden. See, nobody's left out of that. No one's excluded from God's plan of salvation. Again, I, I want to just mention in passing the fact that there's prejudice in the church. And even though we understand that we're supposed to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, there's those universal terms again. Sometimes prejudice will keep us out of certain neighborhoods. Sometimes affluence. You see, rich people tend to want to hang out with poor people, right? No, they want to hang out with rich people. I remember one time we was getting ready, when I was just a, a, a young Christian, just, just obeyed the gospel, we was getting ready to go out and knock doors. 
And uh, one of the men in the congregation says, now, you know, we want to go to the rich people in this town. Those are the kind of people that we want in this congregation. That's what he said. I've had other brethren tell me that they wouldn't preach the gospel to black people. That's what they said. I've heard other people say that they wouldn't take the gospel to homosexuals. That's what they said. You know, Jesus went in and ate with sinners not to necessarily extend fellowship, but to try to teach them the error of their ways. And he was criticized for that. Jesus went to the poor. Right? He invites everyone to come. And we're supposed to go to all. To all nations. To every creature. I love those universal terms. It doesn't leave anybody out. Did Jesus just die for the rich? Did Jesus just die for the white? Did Jesus just die for those people that, that commit less offensive sins? You know, there's a doctrine, uh, limited atonement. And I believe we don't teach that kind of limited atonement, that Jesus just died for those who were destined to be saved. But I believe that we teach by implication a type of limited atonement if we teach that the gospel is not for all. Again, shame on us. Shame on those that have that attitude. Jesus died for all. Jeremiah's prophecy. But this shall be the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after these days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sins no more. Jeremiah 31 Verse 33 and 34. The nature of God's grace is universal. In fact, I was talking about God's grace and His love and His mercy. And some people think that that's exclusive. God will never condemn somebody in sin because of His love and mercy and grace. But you know, if that's the case, as John said in the previous lesson, some people take love to the extent that if we apply it the way they teach it, Jesus would never have to have died on the cross. But in reality, in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, what? God commended His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For God so loved the world. How much? What's the degree? That's that word so. What's the degree of His love? For God so loved the Jews. No, that's not what it says, right? For God so loved the whites. No, it doesn't even say that. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believed in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. In what sense did God give His Son? He gave Him as a sacrifice. For what purpose did He give that sacrifice? Because he loved the world in spite of the fact that we sin and fall short of his glory. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23. God loves us. He loves us in spite of our sin. Jesus died on the cross because of our sin. And God's grace is extended to every man. You know in Titus chapter 2 and verse 11. God, God's grace has appeared unto all men, teaching us, what? The denying and godliness and worldly love, we, lust, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. It's extended to all men, not just a few. Jesus died for all. Salvation is a two-part proposition. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourself. It's the gift of God on God's part. Salvation is by grace. That's everything that, that God does for us that we cannot do for ourselves. Which would include the entire Bible. The production of the entire Bible. 
all of the prophecies in the Old Testament leading up the lineage of Christ from the time of the first sin of Adam and Eve to the time that he died on the cross. The instruction we get in the New Testament, all of those things are the product of God's grace. Everything that God has done for us to redeem us is a product of his grace. And those things we could never do for ourselves. Likewise, on man's part, man's part is a response to that grace. To obey the commandments to receive that grace. And we think about this idea of obedience. James deals with it in chapter 1. In fact, he says there, Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. He also stated that one must be not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. Wait a minute, is there works? There are works that I must do. Be you a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. You see, the things that God requires of us in obedience are our part, and we do them by faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10 and verse 17. We cannot stand around and depend on God's grace alone to save us. That's a very popular denominational idea. And it's even crept into the Lord's church where some believe that there's not one wit that any man can do to contribute to his own salvation. Right? But that's not the case. We need to be a doer of the work in order to be blessed in our deeds or our actions. In fact, God's part of salvation and man's part of salvation, of course, God's part by grace, Man's part by faith, and faith without works, again, James says, is dead, being alone. Chapter 2 and verse 26. The emphasis is always on obedience, not just faith only. It must be understood that the gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. Jesus said, it's the spirit that quickens. The flesh profits nothing. The, wor the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. John 6 and verse 63. Notice, the spirit quickens. But how does the spirit quicken? Jesus says, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. We think about God's word and the power that it has. It will quicken, John 6 and verse 63. It will cleanse, John 15 and verse 3. It will sanctify, John 17 and verse 17. It will edify, Acts chapter 20 and verse 32. It will give us an inheritance, again, Acts 30, or 20 rather, in verse 32. It will bring about the new birth, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 23. And it will illuminate our path, Psalm 119 verse 105. And the Word of God will do all of those things without the help of the Holy Spirit. In fact, the Holy Spirit accomplishes those same things through the Word. And so when we think about this idea of God's plan to save man and error being confronted, that's one of the errors, is get the work of the Holy Spirit right. Again, denominationalism has been off on the Holy Spirit for decades, maybe even uh, centuries if you want. Decades at least. And now this this same idea of the work of the Holy Spirit being perverted by members of the Lord's church. Faith in Jesus is necessary for salvation. Jesus warned you shall die in your sins, for if you believe, that I am not, believe not that I am He, you'll die in your sins. John chapter 8 and verse 24. John 12 and verse 48 will be judged by the words that He spoke in the last day. Those, the, those words... That Jesus spoke those words of the New Testament 
will produce faith. Romans 10 and verse 17. John chapter 3 verse 16. Again, one of the most well-known verses in the Bible. Talks about believing in Jesus Christ. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. The word faith there comes from the Greek word pistuo, which according to Thayer means conviction conjoined with obedience. The idea of faith and obedience are tied to the definition of that word. We cannot overlook that. By its very definition... Faith includes obedience. For this cause Jesus became the author of eternal salvation to all those who obey him. Hebrews 5 and verse 9. We must confess our faith in Jesus in order to be saved. Jesus asked his disciples a question. Whom do men say that I the son of man am? This is Matthew chapter 16 beginning in verse 13. Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's verses 15 and 16. Peter's confession of faith in Jesus Christ is the foundation upon which the church is to be built. That's verse 18. Upon this rock, not Peter, he's a pebble. The church is built upon the bedrock foundation of the fact that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, literally God in the flesh. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, verse 32 and 33, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father which is in heaven. Whosoever denies me before men, him will I deny before my Father which is in heaven. When the Ethiopian requested baptism, Philip said, If thou believe with all thy heart, thou mayest. And after he made that good confession, that he believed that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, they stopped the chariot that went down in the water, and Philip baptized him. But he made that good confession. Confession of faith in Jesus is more than simply a statement of our belief. That's part of it. But it's really an acknowledgement of His position and authority over us in our life. If I confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, I'm acknowledging that I am in a subordinate relationship to Him. A submissive relationship to Him. And that I'm going to obey His will in all things. That's what that confession implies. But yet Jesus asked those in his day in Luke chapter 4 and verse 46, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? In fact, in Matthew chapter 7, along about verse 21, he says, Not everyone that, calls, that says, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but whosoever does the will of my Father which is in heaven. So accepting Jesus as our Lord is saying something about our relationship to Him. And I believe that most people in the world who would call themselves Christian, and even a great number of people in the Lord's church, want a Savior, but they don't want a Lord. I want to be saved from my sins, but I don't want to be responsible, nor do I want to be accountable to Jesus Christ. If Jesus is going to be our Lord, that means something. It means, according to Thayer, that Jesus has authority and power over us. That's what Lord means. It's used in this way in the New Testament. It's used as a title of respect in John chapter 4, verse 11, 15, and 19. It's used as a title of leaner, uh, uh, legal ownership of property, Galatians 4 and verse 1. And by the way, when we think about Jesus as our Lord, every one of these uses would fit Him in His relationship to us. We need to use Lord as a title of respect for Jesus. He is our Lord. We need to understand that we are His property. It's used in reference to the head of a household. 
Romans chapter 7 and verse 4. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 23 and, uh, through 27. Jesus has, Jesus has the right to be called Lord since the church is his bride. It's used in, in reference to the master-slave relationship. The master is the kurios. When Jesus says no man can serve two masters, in, in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24, he used the word kurios there. Same is true in Matthew 10 and verse 14. The servant is not above the master. And again, he's talking about his relationship to his disciples. Jesus is Lord and therefore, he is our master, and we are his servant. Curios is a title given to one who has authority to make decisions, such as a magistrate. And the Bible states that God has given authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. John 5 and verse 26. Jesus says, The Father judges no man, but has committed all judgment unto his Son. John 5 and verse 22. Jesus is a Lord in the sense of a position of authority over us. And when we make that good confession, we're certainly acknowledging that fact. Jesus being Lord and being our Savior and being the Son of God, literally God in the flesh, has a right to dictate how we live. And so in Luke chapter 13, verse 3 and 5, he commands us to repent. Except you repent, you all likewise perish. Acts chapter 17 and verse 30, God commands all men everywhere to repent. There's those universal terms again. Is anybody left out? Remember, God promised to save us from our sins and not in our sins. We need to turn from them. have more to say about repentance, but John's going to cut me short. Repentance is produced by godly sorrow which is produced by the Word of God, 2 Corinthians 7, verses 9 and 10. And it also leads us to a change of life. John, the baptizer, not John West, refused to baptize those who failed to demonstrate their repentance by change of life, Luke chapter 3 and verse 8. And I bet if truth be told, John probably refused people to baptism if they refused to repent as well, change their life. When fruits of repentance are forthcoming. And see, somebody can come up, and we see this happen a lot of times during invitation. Somebody will come up and say, well, you know, if I have offended anybody, now you should know whether you've offended somebody or not. And if you're not sure, why are you coming forward? Right? You know, there are certain things, certain indications that we can look at. Somebody comes up, and uh, wants to repent of drinking, and he's got alcohol in his breath, you might wonder whether he's sincere in that, right? If a homosexual comes forward and he's got his partner with him, says they want to obey the gospel, what are you going to do? What's the solution? They have to repent. What's, what's going to happen if they repent? They have to separate. They have to stop that sinful action. And all would agree with that, right? Everybody would say, oh, them homosexuals, they got to stop that. We can't tolerate that in this congregation. But we'll overlook adultery, right? Some, some congregations overlook fornication. People living together, members in good standing. People in unscriptural marriages, members in good standing. Come forward, want to be baptized, living in adultery, have no intended of stopping that adulterous relationship. We just lead them over to the baptism, baptistry, immerse them. They come up a wet sinner, and they go home. It's exactly what happens because they haven't repented. And then be baptized for a mission of sin. You know, I don't know why Baptists and other denominational people have a problem with baptism. I know it doesn't fit into their theology so that's one thing but the Bible's so very plain on it Mark chapter 16 verse 15 to 16 go into all the world preach the gospel to every creature he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved I don't know grammar that well 
But I know that little word and connects belief and baptism with equal force to salvation. It takes both belief and baptism in order to be saved. It's that simple. Baptism is for remission of sin, Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. It's to wash our sins away, Acts chapter 22 and verse 16. We could go on and on talking about baptism. But one verse in particular, 1 Peter 3 and verse 21, baptism does now save us. I'm going to stop there. Jesus confronted the sin and error regarding the plan of salvation. And you know, we need to do that too. We cannot tolerate error in any form in the church. Whether it's on the plan, the very simple plan of salvation. Whether it's the authority of the New Testament. Whether it's on worship. Whether it's on pride, on love, anything. Because all of those things are essential to our salvation. And we cannot afford to be wrong on any of those things. Unfortunately, when we stand in this pulpit and other pulpits and defend the truth and point out error and demand that people repent of that error and conform to the New Testament, they don't like it. A lot of it's motivated by pride. I don't want to get into judging motives, but a lot of people are prideful. They don't want to admit when they're wrong. They don't want to admit when they're in sin. And so a lot of times our response when we point out sin, we point out error is, well, y'all are just mean-spirited. What did you call us? Mossbacks? We're out of touch with, with society? We're out of touch with now, right? No. We need to get back to the Bible. Do Bible things in Bible ways. Call Bible things by Bible names. Thank you for your time. That's a rude sound. I know it is. <laughs> but you know how to stop. Some of us don't. <laughs> Thank you, Bruce, for that fine lesson. Plain, simple, straightforward. Teaching the salvation. That's We need to understand that and know that there are errors being taught today can, uh, around the world and sadly enough now in the brotherhood about a very simple plan that God left for us.